this is the female reproductive system. So this is a combination from both exercises 42 and 43. This is the side view of the female internal reproductive organs. And if you notice, uh, in terms of the placement of them, it's kind of right in the middle. If we look from the uh, starting on the left side of the screen in the picture, you see the rectum and then the anus. In front of that would be the uterus with the connection of the vagina, which connects to the uh, outside. On top of the uterus, uh, in this picture, it's actually to the side, is the ovary and the fallopian tubes. And then in front, uh, the vagina and kind of tucked under the uterus is the urinary bladder and the urethra opening to the outside. So from the anterior or the front, the three openings in the female, it's going to be the urethra, then the vagina, and then the anus. From a side view, looking at, once again, the internal anatomy, you have uh, two ovaries. They are helped, held in place by ligaments. The uterus, the ovaries, and the uh, uterine tubes are all helped and secured in place by the various ligaments. The ovary is where the eggs are stored and where ovulation is going to occur, which is the release of that egg. The uterine tube, which is also known as the fallopian tube, which is also known as the oviduct, will connect to the uterus. Now keep in mind that the ovary is not directly attached to the uterine tube. It is right next to it, but it's not directly attached to it. The end of the uterine tube has these finger-like projections called the fembrae, and they're going to move, creating kind of a current. So when ovulation occurs, it, that current is going to draw the egg into the uterine or fallopian tube. The Uterus, as we'll see, is composed of multi-layers, the walls of that uterus, and then the opening of the uterus to the vagina is the cervix, and the vagina is the basically the tube that connects from the uterus down to the exterior. If we look at the ovaries, there's two of them. As I said, uh, associate with them are the uterine tubes, and those fembrae are the projections that will help as the movement draw in the egg to the, the uterine tube. In the ovary, this is where the oocyte, which is the egg, is developing. And ultimately, uh, ovulation, it will be released. And then notice the yellow, the corpus luteum. After ovulation, the corpus luteum will be releasing some hormones, as we will discuss in a moment, to help prepare the uterus should fertilization occur. If you look at the two regions of the ovary, there's the ovary cortex and the ovary medulla. By now you should be very familiar with cortex is going to be the outer area, medulla is internal. So the ovarian cortex contains these developing oocytes. They will be enclosed in capsules that we call follicles. And we give them different names of um, primary and then secondary for the uh, vesticular follicles as the development proceeds. In the ovarian medulla, you have blood vessels, you have nerves, and the lymphatic vessels that are all helping to serve the ovary. With the uterus, in terms of the external regions looking at it, there are three different areas. The top portion or superior portion is called the fundus. This is often when a woman is pregnant, what uh, the midwife or the nurse or the doctor will be feeling for the top of the the uterus or the fundus region to get an idea as the pregnancy is progressing this will move up. The body or the corpus is the main part of the uterus and then the isthmus is the inferior or the 
bottommost area that gives rise to the cervix. From some clinical aspects or connections, applications, cervical cancer. Cervical cancer typically will develop right near that cervical orifice, that's the bottom of the uterus, and the epithelial uh, tissue that is there. One thing they are finding is that a lot of cases of cervical cancer we can relate back to a previous infection by HPV, human papillomavirus. Not all of them, that's not the sole cause for cervical cancer, but it's one of the causes. Obviously, the cervix is internal, so the individual may be asymptomatic for long periods of time, and that's the importance of having a pap smear, which is a simple procedure where they can scrape off some of the cells from the cervix to see if there's abnormalities there. Early detection is so important. Cervical cancer can be easily treated if caught early. So that's why it's very important to have this done on an annual basis. In terms of the internal components or anatomy of the uterus, it's made up of three layers. The innermost is the endometrium. The middle layer, which is the thickest of the three layers, is the myometrium, as the name implies. It is composed of smooth muscles. And then the outermost layer is the parametrium. Once again, a clinical application, endometriosis. This is when endometrial tissue appears outside of the uterus, oftentimes on the ovaries. The problem is it's stimulated by hormones to go through the monthly cycle of increasing the tissue and increasing the blood flow. And when this happens, uh, the endometrial tissue that's outside of the uterus is doing this accumulation of blood and tissue and blood can be released into the pelvic cavity. This leads to, it can be very painful and it can lead to scar tissue. So oftentimes uh, there's different medications they may try and ultimately surgery to remove the endometrial tissue that's not obviously in the proper location. This is just a cross section of a slide and then the schematic drawing showing that you, because there's a lot of changes in growth of that tissue, there's a lot of uh, extensive blood supply to the endometrial tissue. Outside of the uterus, the connection to the external environment is the vagina. The vaginal orifice is that opening. It is covered initially by uh, the hymen, which is usually ruptured the first sexual intercourse or insertion of a tampon. Sometimes extreme physical exercise may tear it. PID or pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, there can be different causes for this, such as bacteria. In PIDs, typically what happens is the infection first starts elsewhere, oftentimes in the vagina, and then it can spread up to the uterus, through the fallopian tubes, and then to the ovaries. And remember, the fallopian tubes are open. They're not directly touching the ovaries. So that allows it to spread into the abdominal pelvic cavities. In a severe case, that infection can spread to other organs besides the reproductive organs. Symptoms would be fever, low abdominal pain. You would obviously have an increased white blood count. Oftentimes, abnormal vaginal discharge. This can be treated with antibiotics. If it is left untreated and the infection proceeds for long periods of time, it can lead to scarring of the uterine tubes. If there's extensive scarring in the uterine tubes, that can lead to infertility. So obviously, any infection you want to treat as soon as possible. Vaginitis is... Uh, Infection, inflammation of the vaginal wall, it can be caused by viruses, bacteria, or fungi. It is usually very painful, and so once again, obviously, you want to treat it. Uh, it can lead to infertility because 
with the inflammation, there's typically less mucus made. Anyway, it can affect the survival rate of the sperm. So it decreases the survival rate of the sperm, leading to infertility issues. If we look at the external genitalia of the female, start with the mons pubis. This is the amount of fat and skin that's covering the pubic symphysis. During uh, or at puberty, when the secondary sexual characteristics uh, appear, it becomes covered with hair. And then just beyond that is the vulva, which includes two pairs of skin folds, the vestibule, the cl clitoris, the urethral orifice, vaginal orifice, and perineum. The two fatty skin folds, or <coughs> two sets of them, the lava majora is the outermost one that's covered with pubic hair. And then the inner one, the smaller of the skin folds, is lava minora. It is not covered with hair and tends to have a more of a pinkish color due to the uh, blood supply, rich blood supply going to it. The vestibule area contains both the urethral orifice. Remember, this is the urethra opening coming from the urinary bladder. And behind that is the vaginal orifice. The clitoris is going to be anterior or in front of the vestibule. Uh, this is the female equivalent of the penis because it is composed of erectile tissue. Mammary glands are modified sweat glands. Uh, they do develop in both the males and females, but they're only functional in females and only when a uh, female is breastfeeding. On the breast, the pigmented, circular pigmented skin right by the nipple is the areola. The nipple is in the center of the areola, and that's obviously where the baby is going to be sucking and obtaining the milk from. The breast contains several ducts. They're called the lactoferrous ducts, which are uh, glands that secrete milk into the ducts, and they all will converge at the nipple. So as you can see here, there's the whole, what we call lobe. There's several lobes. Each one of those have the ducts that are draining the milk. They all, as I said earlier, they'll all converge at the nipple so that when the infant is suckling, it is able to get milk. Breast cancer. Most people associate it with females. However, please be aware that males can also get breast cancer. Uh, about one in eight women in the United States will be affected by breast cancer. It can metastasize fairly quickly if the cancer cells break off and if it travels towards some uh, lymph nodes. Places where the cancer, once it gets in the lymph nodes and travels to other locations, some of the more common locations are in the vertebrae, the brain, the liver, or the lungs. What are some risk factors for developing breast cancer? Certainly, uh, there is a genetic component, so if there's a family history of it, that is going to put you at higher risk. Increased estrogen levels can also be a contributing risk factor. Women who are over 40 are advised to have annual mammograms and to conduct those monthly self-examinations. They will often recommend a woman in her late 30s to have a baseline mammogram that then can be compared to the mammogram she has after she turns 40. There are two different cycles that are occurring simultaneously in females. There's the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle. The ovarian cycle is roughly a monthly changes that occur in the ovary, as the name implies, in ultimately leading towards ovulation or release of the egg. And then the uterine cycle, which is also known as the menstrual cycle, are changes that occur in the endometrium. With the ovarian cycle, about each month, uh, about 6 to 12 of the primordial follicles are induced. They're stimulated by the follicle stimulating hormone to start to grow and mature. Now about day 0 to day 14 is what is called the follicular uh, phase. This is when that follicle stimulating hormone uh, stimulates 
uh, the follicles to produce estrogen, and then the luteinizing hormone will stimulate ovulation. Ovulation is the release of the oocyte, which is the scientific term for the egg. The luteal phase is day 14 to 28, and this is when after ovulation has occurred, the remains of that follicle that was surrounding the the oocyte or the egg is, is in a follicle, it's in a uh, vesicle that we call the follicle. So once ovulation has occurred, once it has released the egg, the remains of that um, becomes what we call the corpus luteum. And that's going to produce proge uh, both progesterone for the uh, uterus. The idea is it's helping to prepare the uterus should fertilization occur and then implantation of the embryo in the uterus. If no implantation occurs, then that corpus luteum is going to basically form scar tissue. So on this diagram, you can see the ovarian cycle. If you look at the primary follicles in pink at the top, and you have the oocyte in the middle of it. As I said, the, the follicle is like a, a vesicle around. You have cells growing around that oocyte or around the egg. It becomes the secondary follicle. You get more fluid in there, and it's called then the vesticular follicle. And then when uh, the luteinizing hormone stimulates ovulation to occur. As you can see at the bottom right, you have the release of that oocyte. And then the remains of the follicle stay in the ovary. As you can see by the yellow, it develops into that corpus luteum. If, once again, implantation does not occur in the uterus, then it will start to break down and form scar tissue. So this is showing the primordial follicle. It is simply the oocyte surrounded by just a simple squamous uh, one layer of cells. The primary follicle, now it's simple cuboidal follicle cells. Secondary follicle, now you have stratified and meaning multi, remember multi layers of cuboidal cells. So it's getting larger and larger. Then you start to have uh, fluid accumulate in there. And then the vesticular follicle, you have a large uh, amount of fluid that is in with the oocyte. <coughs> this is prior to ovulation occurring. Now after ovulation has occurred, now you have the corpus luteum. That is what remains of the follicle that ruptured to release the, the oocyte. The uterine or menstrual cycle is going to be controlled by estrogen and progesterone. There's three phases, the menstrual phase, proliferation phase, and the secretory phase. On average, it's about 28 days in length. Obviously, that's an average, so individuals, it will vary. The menstrual phase is roughly days 1 through 5. In the, during this phase, the estrogen and progesterone levels are declining. Uh, menstruation is the shedding of that endometrium layer. It lasts for anywhere from one to seven days. On day six to 14, only a small part of the endometrium is left after menstruation. Estrogen levels are going to start to increase. And what we see is the endometrium starts to build up again. The cervix is going to thin and you tend to have little channels that will allow for the sperm to pass into the, the uterus. Days 15 through 28, the uterus is now prepared for implantation of an embryo. Progesterone levels rise. This is controlled by the corpus luteum. Estrogen levels are going to decrease initially, but then increasingly. The endometrium thickens glandular activity increases. Once again, this is all for preparation of implantation of the embryo. So in this diagram, you can see uh, the at the bottom, the 
histology slides and up at the top the schematic drawings of uh, you can see how that endometrium that inner white layer how it thickens over time in the menstrual cycle to prepare for implantation and then if implantation does not occur then the cycle will start over and at the beginning it will be the la most of the layers of the endometrium will be shed So what about the egg? Well, males are able to produce sperm throughout their, their entire reproductive lives. Females, however, only have a set number of eggs. During early development in the fetus, what happens is cells will migrate to the ovaries and they will differentiate or specialize and become the, what we call the oogonium. They will divide for a few min, uh, months and then they differentiate or specialize and become the primary oocytes. That's what's going to be the eggs. During about the fifth month of development, and we're still talking about the, in the, the embryo, the fetus, so fifth month of the pregnancy, there's about 7 million primary oocytes have been formed. But most of these from the fifth month to the seventh month, most of these will basically degenerate, disintegrate, break down. The remaining ones are going to be surrounded by just a single layer of squamous cells. And this is forming the prior, uh, well, the primordial uh, follicle. Now during development, more of the primary oocytes are going to be degenerating. So by the time uh, of the birth of a female baby, newborn, there's only about a million of these primordial follicles. By the time a girl reaches puberty, there's about 400,000 of them left. So you can see the numbers are greatly decreasing. During a woman's reproductive life, only about 400 to 500 of these follicles will go through the maturation and be released at ovulation. So the numbers are quite low as compared to the male. So this table is just showing the, the mitotic events. That is the cell division that occurs with the sex cells. In this case, obviously showing with the egg that before birth you start to form the primary oocyte and then it kind of um, at birth it, it stops or what we call a rest in the prophase one stage and then it stays at that, that point until a young girl reaches puberty and then it picks up basically where it left off the bottom line of this basically is telling you for females, the number of eggs that you have at birth, that's all you've got. You do, the ones that you have will continue to mature when you reach puberty and then once a month you have ovulation occurring, but you do not throughout your life produce brand new oocytes or brand new eggs. Males do, but females do not. So when ovulation occurs, that released oocyte, because the fembrae are moving, that creates a current. And like I said earlier, it's going to draw that oocyte into the uterine tube. Now it's going to take about three to four days for it to reach all the way to the uterus. Now, the oocyte is only going to be living or viable for 12 to 24 hours. So stop and think about that for a second. If it's going to take three to four days to reach the uterus, but it's only alive for 12 to 24 hours, that means fertilization has to occur while it's still in the uterine tube. And that's exactly what's going to happen. If that egg is fertilized, now we call it the uh, zygote. It's going to start going through mitosis while it's still traveling through the uterine tube towards the uh, uterus. 
if pregnancy, if fertilization occurs, what happens to prepare for the pregnancy? The placenta is going to produce a special hormone that helps to maintain that corpus luteum, which is secreting hormones to make the uterus compatible for implantation. So what's implantation? Well, by about day four, that developing uh, zygote, which is going through mitosis, it's the fertilized egg, it has been going through mitosis, so it's slowly growing number of cells. It implants in the endometrium by about day six or seven. It has to attach to the, the endometrium, that inner wall of the uterus, in order for the pregnancy to occur. If it does not implant in the uterine wall, then it will be released and no pregnancy will occur. And it must implant in the uterine wall because if it implants uh, in the uterine tube or the fallopian tube, that's what's referred to as a tubal pregnancy, and that can be extremely dangerous. Obviously, the pregnancy cannot continue there. Um, the uterine tube is, is not designed to nourish and maintain the pregnancy, so it's detrimental to the developing um, what we call the developing embryo, and it's also very detrimental and dangerous for the mother. So what do birth control uh, pills do? It's containing estrogen and progesterone, which are inhibiting the follicle-stimulating hormone, and it inhibits the luteinizing hormone. So luteinizing hormone triggers ovulation, and follicle-stimulating hormone uh, gets that follicle ready to release the developing the oocyte and also helps to prepare the uterus. So both of those are inhibited by the estrogen and progesterone. 